So in this video, I just want to give a very brief introduction to the subject of analytic number theory. Now this is a really exciting field of maths in which we can use methods from mathematical analysis and apply those same techniques to solve problems in number theory. And one of the most famous problems in this field is the Riemann hypothesis, and that's a statement about the zeros or the roots of the Riemann zeta function. And I've defined the Riemann zeta function over here. It's zeta of s equals the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of 1 over n to the s, where the real part of s is greater than 1, because s could be a complex number. So for instance, zeta of 2, so if I put s equals 2 here, I'd get 1 over 1 squared plus 1 over 2 squared plus 1 over 3 squared, and if I keep on doing that, that's equal to pi squared over 6. And this Riemann hypothesis is one of those famous Clay Institute problems, and if you can prove it, you can actually win a million dollars, which is pretty cool. So you might be looking at this and thinking, well, how can a function like this have any zeros at all? And you'd be perfectly within a right to criticize me for this. But it's actually possible to redefine this function by a process called analytic continuation so that we can try to understand this function for other values of s, not just values of s whose real part is greater than 1. So another dubious result you might have seen somewhere on the internet is this result right here. So that's 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus blah blah blah, that's apparently equal to minus 1 12th. Now this is intentionally dubious and, in, and misleading, and I've written it down like this on purpose. But this does make sense in terms of the Riemann zeta function, perhaps not in this form, but if we can extend this analytically, then we can start to appreciate this result a bit more. So the analytic number theory is not simply about the Riemann hypothesis. Another reason why people like to study this is to know something about the distribution of primes. So there are a bunch of other really cool results. So if we just write down the prime numbers, so if you've got 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, uh, 23, 29, 31, and so on and so forth. And I can keep on writing these uh, all day long. But these prime numbers appear to be distributed in a very random, sort of irregular kind of fashion. And the question that everyone has always wondered is, what could the nth prime number be? So we know that the fourth prime number here is 7, the uh, the fifth prime number is 11. What What is the nth prime number? So what is the, um, the nth prime number in this sequence? So to answer this question, we're going to have to study something called the prime counting function pi of x. And that basically tells you the number of primes less than or equal to x. And if we study the asymptotics of this, we can get some surprising results. So for instance, we have the so-called prime number theorem, which is one of the most celebrated theorems in mathematics. And that tells you that pi of x, the prime counting function, is asymptotically equal to x over log x. And so an equivalent way of writing this is to say that the nth prime number is actually n log n. So for arbitrarily large n, you can expect uh, the nth prime number to be about n log n. And there's a whole host of other fascinating material that I could talk about. For instance, it has long been known that there are infinitely many prime numbers. But an even more observation, an even more interesting observation from this field, says a similar result about the infinitude of primes in arithmetic progressions. But I'll get to that later. So that was my very brief introduction to analytic number theory. If you like what you saw, make sure you like this video, comment and subscribe, and make sure to check out our Facebook and Twitter pages in the description box below. So see you next time.